time for us to check back in with Sydney Sailor Farr and see what happens next in the book. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. Chapter 5, Decoration Day. One thing we all need is more light during the dark days. We must shine brighter ourselves to take up the slack where there is need. In my home in the mountains, we observe Decoration Day on May 30th every spring. Weeks before, people would take up shovels, rakes, hoes, and other tools and would clear off the graveyards and spruce up the area. Then on Decoration Day, they would travel to various cemeteries, carrying both fresh and artificial flowers, plants, picnic baskets, and jugs of water and Kool-Aid. They would spend hours on the various hilltops socializing with other families, sometimes listening to an impromptu sermon or homily if a preacher happened to be on the premises. Then they would return home for another year. We had an old-fashioned rose bush in our front yard, and there usually were early blooms by the end of May. Mama would take bunches of them to decorate graves on May 30th. Decoration Day had its origins as a day to celebrate and remember the veterans of the Civil War. I don't remember any mention of this during the Decoration Day observances of my youth. If a veteran had passed away during the year, he would be remembered with all the others. Even now, of course, though May 30th is now known as Memorial Day, people still take wreaths and flowers to the graves of family members and friends who have passed on. Wakes and funerals in the mountains were attended by almost everyone, including small children. One of my earliest memories is standing in the sunshine beside an open grave looking down at a dead baby laying in an open homemade casket. The baby's blue eyes were wide open. Young parents kept crying and touching the baby's face. I never got over the horror of that experience. Even today, the memory makes me want to cry. I remember another funeral in the springtime on Ben's branch at a small hilltop graveyard. Pines grew near the edge of the clearing and green moss covered the ground under the trees, the rocks, and the old wooden benches where people sat. I was five years old by that time and do not remember much that was said or done, but I do recall the way the moss and wildflowers looked and how the soft wind stirred the pine branches silhouetted against the clear sky and how the carpet of pine needles covered the ground. I wondered if this was the heaven people were talking about. When I was six, while we still lived on Coon Branch at the head of Stony Fork, I experienced new life and death for the first time. Martha Jane, Mama's sister, lived on Pumpkin Knob to the north of us. She had six children and was soon to have another baby. One day in August, word came that she was in labor and having trouble. The midwife sent word for Mama and the other sisters to come and help out. Dad was on a hunting trip, so Mama had to take us with her. A number of relatives were already at the house when we arrived. Aunt Mossy was bossing all the children around and trying to get dinner dishes washed and supper on the table. We went in to see Martha Jane. She didn't speak. She just kept moaning and saying, Lord, have mercy. The adults were all kneeling around the bed and praying for her. I remember her husband, Uncle Dewey, kneeling between the bed and the wall, crying and calling to Aunt Martha Jane to get better. They said, Amen, and the Holy Ghost blessed Martha Jane. She began waving her arms about and shouting. I quietly slipped outside and walked around in a daze. I did not know what was happening and what it meant when a baby could not be born. I tried to say a prayer and grieve like the others were doing, but I just couldn't. I picked up a fork from the kitchen floor. Poor Aunt Martha Jane, her fork is on the floor, I mourned aloud. I heard a muted whimpering coming from underneath the house and crawled under the porch to investigate. I remembered that Cousin Willie Gladys had told us that her mother was going to have a new baby and their dog was going to have new pups. I watched the dog to see what would happen. A wet little body emerged and fell to the ground. I started to move closer, but the dog growled and I was afraid of her. As I watched, several more pups dropped to the ground. I heard someone call my name and Aunt Mossy stuck her head under the porch and yelled at me. Come out from under there, Sydney. You shouldn't be watching that dog. I'm going to tell your mother. 
I felt scalded in shame at this rebuke, and tears spilled down my cheeks. I grabbed up some clots of dirt and threw them at Aunt Mossy, fast and furious. She backed away from the porch and left, calling for Mama. By the time Aunt Mossy got back into the house, the baby had been born. I heard it crying. I crept onto the front porch, and Aunt Bartha, the midwife, patted me on the head. You children be quiet now. Your poor Aunt Martha Jane is dying, she said. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Bless the name of Jesus. Uncle Dewey had started out to get the doctor. I remember watching him running down the hillside and Aunt Bertha calling out that he didn't have to run. He walked all the way to Pineville and came back with a doctor who was riding a horse. They went on into the house. The doctor left after confirming that Aunt Martha Jane was dead. Other people came out onto the porch, some of them sobbing. I heard Aunt Bertha say, Children, keep praying. She might vine up again. How could a poor sick woman vine up, I wondered. Years later, I realized she had meant that Aunt Martha Jane might revive. I went into the kitchen where Mama stood. I remembered how Aunt Bertha said we must praise the Lord no matter what happens. Well then, praise the Lord, I said as loud as I could. Mama's face turned red, and she slapped me. Don't you ever say things like that, she screamed at me. I ran outside and leaned against the front yard fence, crying in outrage and bewilderment. At dusky dark, Dad rode in and unsaddled his mule. He picked me up and carried me onto the porch. Sitting down in a rocking chair, he asked me what had made me cry. In a jumble, I tried to tell him about the pups, Aunt Martha Jane's fork on the kitchen floor, and Mama and Aunt Mosey making me mad. I nestled into his arms, safe and secure. Dad made everything all right. Weeks later, I heard Dad talking to Grandpa about the night and the tragic loss of the mother to her family of young children. I'd been to Kettle Island, Dad said to Grandpa, and when I come home, Rachel and Mossy were gone. I figured Martha Jane was sick to have her baby. I didn't know at the time that she was already dead. Old Bob, my mule, is going blind in his old age, I reckon, Dad continued. I have to make torches out of any kind of dry brush that I can find for him to see by and lead him out of places. It's just at night he can't see. When I'm riding along and he starts snuffling the ground, I stop for I know he can't see anything and is trying to trail the road by smell. I started over the hill to Martha Jane's house and had to strike matches all the way and lead old Bob clear around a pumpkin knob. I have no memory of Aunt Martha Jane's funeral. I never thought to ask Mama for details. After my aunt died, her older girls took care of the siblings, including the new baby. Eventually, Uncle Dewey married again, and the family continued. Chapter 6, Growing Years Those in my world who heard the mountain's call told me about things that were past as well as things to come. When I was five and my sister Della was not yet four, Dad moved us from Coon Branch down to Straight Creek so I could go to school until Dad could get our new house built. We lived in a ramshackle, two-room building at the back edge of the property, which faced a small hill called Little Knob. The roof of the building slanted all one way, with the front high part facing Little Knob. The back wall of the house had no windows and no door, so from inside the house we could not look across the valley to the other side of the mountain. I was sick for weeks that summer. Granny Brock said it was the summer complaint that killed so many children. I remember lying in bed crying because my stomach hurt. I must have dozed off one afternoon. When I woke, I saw that a door had been cut into the back of the house. The sun was setting, and I got up and stood in the doorway, looking at the sky. I ran to Mama. When did Dad cut that door out? Come look, Mama. It lights up the whole house. You've been dreaming, she said. There's no door cut out in that wall. I argued with her until she grabbed my arm and forced me to look at the blank wall. See there, she said, you were dreaming. But my vision was so vivid, I decided that the new door was magic, that only I could see it. For the rest of the time we lived in that house, every morning when I woke, I would turn quickly to look at that wall. I never saw the door again. That same year, late in the fall, I saw another strange thing. Mama, Aunt Mosey, Aunt Laura, and I had walked over 
Birch Lick Mountain to the Red Bird Hospital Free Clinic. As we walked down Mud Lick, I saw a square little house sitting in the edge of someone's yard. Laura and I ran up to it and tried to look through the doll-like windows. I remember how Laura patted the roof, asking who lived there. Its walls were green like jade, and its roof was flat. Later, when I mentioned it, Mama said, I didn't see that. Mama often accused me of telling lies because she believed if you talked about something you only imagined, it was a sin. But I held stubbornly to what I had seen, both the little house and the doorway cut into the back wall of our house. School Days Even though I was not going to be six until October 30th that year, we moved to Straight Creek. I was allowed to start school in August. I fell in love with school my very first day. The one-room school housed all eight grades. Each class was called to the front of the school to read aloud or work problems on the blackboard. I listened to each class all through the grades. I read ahead of my class whenever books were available. By the fourth grade, I had practically memorized the eighth grade reader because I had listened to the class read and recite so often. The teacher decided I was so far ahead of the other children, I could skip fifth grade. The first year I was in school, Dad began to build us a house down the hill from the old building. He cut and hauled in logs to build the house and got rough lumber from Sonny Lefevre's sawmill. The new house had two rooms with a lean-to kitchen. Dad and Grandpa built a filled stone chimney, daubing in the cracks with yellow clay, which they also used in between the logs to keep the cold air out. The front porch extended across both rooms. The back portion of the foundation rested on the ground, but the front half was several feet off the ground with the space underneath underpinned with rock. There was a small crawl hole in one side. Sister Della and I would play in there on hot summer days. One night, Dad was gone on a trip to sell moonshine. We went to bed when it got dark. The younger children soon went to sleep. Mama and I talked a while. By around 9.30 or 10 o'clock, we began to feel sleepy. Suddenly, we heard a knocking under the floor right between our beds. Again and yet again, the knocks came. Knock, knock, knock. Pause. Knock, knock, knock. Pause. There never seemed to be any change in the sound or the rhythm of the knocks. This continued until about midnight. Mama and I lay there for quite a while, too scared to move. Finally, we began to talk loudly so whatever or whoever was there would know we were awake. It made no difference. The steady knocks continued. Then Mama got her shoe and hit it loudly on the floor, hoping to scare away whatever it was. But the knocks kept on until about midnight when they abruptly ceased. The next day, Dad crawled under the house and looked for evidence of what might have been under there, but all he found was the rag doll Della and I had been playing with the day before. I always believed that either a real person or a ghost was under our porch that night. A year or so after that, on a very dark night, when we were all in bed, another strange thing happened. I slept at that time on a little cot in a corner opposite to where the other two beds were in the room. All at once, I felt uneasy. I felt as though something was looking at me. Then on the end of my pillow, something began a soft tapping. It was just exactly the way a cat would do if it was playfully patting the pillow with its paw. This happened several times. Pat, 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 pause. Pat, 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 pause. Before I screamed. Dad jumped up and lit the coal oil lamp on the table. There was nothing in the room that we could see. I've always believed that what was patting my pillow was a big cat that Dad had seen one night playing with a bind of golden fodder in the moonlight around the structure of our new house. One night, Dad rode in and was getting corn from the crib to feed his horse. He heard something make a rustling sound and turned around facing the framework of our new house. He said he saw a big black cat walking along, tossing a bind of fodder up in the air and catching it with his paws. Dad said he started walking toward the cat, but as he got closer, it went under the foundation and disappeared. I believe there are supernatural beings and spirits. I believe there are physical and spiritual laws that we know nothing about. Who is to say 
for sure there are not unseen entities all around us perhaps there's a warp now and then in the curtain that separates our realm from other realms that allows us to catch glimpses of these other entities man has learned enough about the laws of nature to send ships into space and to enable men to walk on the moon feats unbelievable to those who lived in an earlier time perhaps in the future we may use those same laws to usher us into infinity games we played as the oldest child it was my responsibility to bring the cow in for the morning and evening milking at times i was frightened at having to do this chore particularly when the fog was thick and tasseled in the trees or if the cow was in the holler between little knob and big knob Little Knob had a graveyard on its flat top with some of its graves so old that the carving on the stones was half obliterated and others so new that faded and strained crepe paper flowers would still be sitting there on the graves. There was always so much work to be done that there was little time to play, but we kids were crazy for play and grabbed every opportunity. We played Annie over, pitching a ball over the top of the house from one side while the others tried to catch it on the other side. We played drop the handkerchief, standing in a circle with one person going outside the circle and quietly dropping a handkerchief behind someone and then running back to the place as person grabbed the handkerchief and chased after the one who dropped it. As early in spring as we possibly could, we would go barefoot. Mama fussed that the ground was still too damp, that a misty rain could still get us sick, that we would catch cold. We paid no attention to her warnings, however, and by full summertime, the soles of our feet were hard and tough. The girls loved to play hopscotch with the blocks marked off in the hard dirt with a sharp stick. We girls dearly loved hopscotch, jumped the rope, and dropped the handkerchief, but the boys did not like to play these games, preferring baseball and marbles. The girls did not think playing baseball and marbles was only for boys, however. In early spring, you could see tight little circles of children on the school grounds playing marbles. We played at morning and afternoon recesses and all through the lunch hour. The boys always played keeps, drawing a circle around their hoard of marbles and their stillies and best shooters gambled with their whole collection. If they won other boys' marbles, they kept them. They scorned girls who wanted to play, but several of us girls were sharpshooters and occasionally the boys would allow one or two of us to play with them. One game that boys and girls played together was horseshoes. I was allowed to play because I had a strong throwing arm. The grown men in the community most often pitched horseshoes on Saturday and Sunday afternoons. The game is still popular. One often sees it being played at picnics and family reunions. There are even horseshoe leagues and national competitions. Boys and girls also played baseball together. There was no money for store-bought baseball, so we would compress and sew together pieces of cloth until we had a ball of material approximately the size of a baseball and almost as hard if one hit you. I was one of the best batters and fastest runners among the girls, and it thrilled me when teams were chosen and the boys wanted me on their teams because they recognized my abilities. No doubt many of the expressions we used in our games, like fudging, dibs, and knucks down, as well as the rhymes we chanted as we jumped rope, or the song we sang when we played Drop the Handkerchief, Skip to My Lou, would sound strange to children today. Some of the games that we played then have been relegated to the past. The Cure for Freckles In the spring when sap rises in maple trees, it also rises in wild grapevines. We would make a small cut in a big grapevine and set a tin can or lard bucket to catch the sap. Mama diluted the sap with a little water and used it as a hair rinse after our weekly shampooing. The water we used for our shampooing and the water used for the clothes that were hand washed was water that Mama would collect from a bucket that she would set under the downspout when it rained. Mama's hair was a dark tawny shade, mine was a light blonde, and my sister Della had Dad's dark chestnut shade of hair. The rinse highlighted millions of gold flecks in Mama's hair and brought out gold highlights in mine and red highlights in Della's. We all felt so proud and fine with our clean, shiny hair. Being fair-skinned and blonde, I freckled easily in the summer sun. I tried everything that was purported to be a cure for freckles. Everything but one cure Aunt Mosey told me about. Mama's sister Mosey married Dad's brother Squire, and our two families lived fairly close to each other. 
One day, my cousins were teasing me, pretending to count my freckles. Aunt Mosey said that if I could find a tree stump with hollow in the top where rainwater had collected and bathed my face in the stump water, my freckles would disappear. It took a while, but I finally found a stump with rainwater standing in it. But I was so repulsed by the ugly, scaly gross in it and the yellowish red color of the water, I could not bring myself to put that stuff on my face. I have some freckles to this day. My life was crammed full those early years with family and friends. For a while, my best friend was Laura Hoskins. We played together at her brother Jeff's house. Jeff and his wife Minnie kept Laura and Jeff's grandmother, Hetty Hoskins, everyone called her Aunt Hetty, out of respect for her age. Aunt Hetty told us many stories of people and places she had known, and she had a trunk which she allowed Laura to open once to show me what was inside. When I saw what was there, I was both attracted and repelled. Aside from a few keepsakes, the contents were a memorial to Aunt Hetty's only daughter, Julia, who had been married to Sam Nunn, a jealous and possessive man with whom she had several children. One day, in a jealous rage, Sam Nunn shot and killed Julia and then rode into Pineville, the county seat, and turned himself into the sheriff. He was tried, found guilty, and served many years in prison. When he got out of prison, he came to live with his son, Sonny Nunn. Sonny was a friend of Dad's, and I knew both nuns. It was a custom in Appalachia to keep the last clothes of the deceased. People also kept locks of hair, which were often woven into a brooch and pictures of the deceased as they lay in their coffins. Sure enough, inside Aunt Hetty's trunk were the clothes Julia Nunn had been wearing in the moment of her death and a picture of her taken shortly before her murder. She was a pretty brown-haired woman with a shy smile and big dark eyes looking directly in the camera. Two or three times a year, Dad, Grandpa, various cousins and uncles saddled up and rode away. Mama said they were going off hunting, but when I got older, I learned that their actual destination was their hidden moonshine still where they went to run off a batch of liquor. Usually at these times, Mama and Grandma took the children and rode over Birch Lake Mountain and down Mud Lake to the Red Bird Mission. There we would go to the free clinics at the hospital and the used clothing sale at the mission office. One time, late in October, two days before my fourth birthday, when the men rode off, Mama decided we would just go spend the night with Grandma. In the afternoon, when the chores were done, she got us ready. She said I was big enough to walk, and she let Della walk part of the way. Mama fastened the yell lock on our front door, picked up baby Clara, and we set out. We walked alongside the creek, crossing it several times on foot logs and swinging bridges, and then we headed up Ben's branch. Most of the way, Mama carried both Della and the baby. It seemed to take us a long time to get there. We stopped to rest on the last hill before we turned down the other side to Grandpa's house. Then we heard the strange noise. Around the hillside to our right, we heard a thump, as if a heavy body had jumped or fallen from a tree. Then came a cry, at first sounding like a woman's cry, then gradually rising to the sound of a train whistle before cutting off abruptly. Terrified, we ran down the mountain. Mama had the baby in her arms and snatched up Della. When I stumbled and fell headlong down the trail, she ordered me to be quiet, not cry. Then somehow, she had me in her arms, too. She ran down to Meadow Branch, then up the road to Grandpa's pasture gate before she put me down. Sobbing for breath, shaking with fright, we hurried into the house. This was the first time I'd seen my mother afraid. We told Grandma what had happened, and she and Mama talked about what could have made those sounds. When the men came home, we told them all about it. For two weeks after that, the men folk talked about hearing an animal on their way to and from work at the Ritter Lumber Sawmill. Then as suddenly as it had come, the sound was gone. Grandpa said it was probably some animal escaped from a circus at Harlan, Pineville, or Middlesboro. We may never know for sure what it was, he said. What's a circus, I asked, but Grandpa didn't answer. Reading and Writing I started out in life full of light and with the clearest vision. I loved everything about words. I remember my feeling of excitement when I learned how to paint pictures with words. I was 10 years old when I began to write little poems and descriptive essays about the mountains. Words came easily to me. 
There were no pictures in our house when I was small. One time when I was around three years old, Mama got some used Christmas cards. I'd never seen anything like them. One card had a cluster of grapes on the front and I tried to bite them off. Even then I was trying to absorb words to describe those grapes. I read everything I could get my hands on. Aunt Deli, who loved to read, shared her books with me. Neighbors down the road from us, Aunt Lefevre, her divorced daughter, Lisa Meredith, and Lisa's two daughters, Lavella and Pauline, read romance magazines and comic books. They passed on copies to me after they read them. Mama never approved of my reading. Those old books are full of lies and will drive you crazy, she often said. Despite Mama's disapproval, I continued to cherish words and books. Every spare minute I was not working or reading, I was writing. I kept my writing bundled up and hidden in the loft. One day, Mama found the bundle and read some of the pages I'd written. She burned them all and told Dad about it. She said I was losing my mind from reading sinful old books all the time. I was furious that she had found my writing and had dared to destroy it. For months after that, both of my parents watched me for bad signs. Mm -hmm. An interesting peek into Sydney's life during this part that we read today. Uh, she kind of had it hard, uh, but had it good too at the same time, which is the way I guess that lots of us are. Her mother didn't understand her. That seems obvious. A little bit of the parts about her mother kind of being hard on her reminds me of if you followed along with the book that we read about Dory, Woman of the Mountains, it kind of reminds me of Dory's mother and Dory. Um, she didn't fully understand Dory either and thought she was silly about a lot of things and, they, and there was kind of an angst between them, but there was also a real bond and you can kind of see that in this this part that we read today where there was um, there was definitely some angst uh, and really made me feel sorry for Sydney remembering about Aunt Martha Jane dying. That's such a sad thing anyway, but to be the little child not understanding and and trying to make, you know, the best decision she knew how and then to be you know slapped in the face and and yelled at thank goodness her daddy was there to comfort her and kind of console her but you can see that that pull between them because then you can also tell by the way that Sydney's writing that she dearly loved her mother at the beginning when she's talking about decoration day churches in my area still have decoration days they're not always on May 30th like uh, Sydney was saying but throughout the usually the spring and the summer months you'll hear about decoration day or homecoming both of those decoration day for sure people decorate the graves and a lot of times church cemeteries in my area you know that's coming up so they kind of clean off all the old flowers and then you can um, you know, you'll bring more, but like for Pap's grave, if we know that's coming and there's something we want left there, we kind of move it and then put it back so that they don't have to worry about whether or not we want it or whether or not we're ready to get rid of it. So those are still really popular in my area. Although Sydney describing it like um, maybe that it was just a weekend or whatever because of that May 30th, for here it would always be on a Sunday and then there would be dinner on the grounds for people to enjoy afterwards. And in that same part where she's talking about that, she talks about the funerals and how it was common to take children to funerals. Definitely in my childhood, it was like that. If Pap and Granny went to a funeral, my brothers and I went right with them. Uh, when Corey and Katie was little, if I went to a funeral, they went right with me. And it, it's not like you're trying, that we were trying to shock them or even teach them. It's just that that was part of the family dynamic is that if you went to a funeral, then you're, you all went, you know. Um, I know a lot of times today we try to more shelter our children and it, that wasn't even a thought about it. It was just that that's, that's part of life. People die and, and we're going to their funeral to show respect and to be there for their family and, and that's just how it is. Of course, when I was real little, I would curl up in Granny's lap and fall asleep. That was also common to see kids asleep in people's laps or on the, stretched out on the bench or you know whatever it was. But. Um, I really hadn't thought about that till I read that part of the book, and then I thought, you know, that is maybe that is different today. Maybe children today don't go to funerals as much as they did when when I was a child or when Sydney was a child. She shared a lot more about the mysterious things that had happened, like the knocking under the house and the sound on the mountain there as she was walking over the um, to the grandmother's house, all those things. So it's it's very interesting those kind of things and and there's some of them like the dot like the door that she thought was there that was probably maybe a fever induced if she was sick but then there's other things that um, while her mother didn't believe of course the door wasn't there or the little house she thought she's seen you could say Sydney was very imaginative then her mother did hear the knock and the sound so really interesting in that part really some 
some spooky things and unexplainable things. Uh, and of course, they were, there may have been a logical explanation for them that they just never, never did find out. And I like the games. Of course, kids today, at least in my area, don't as many of them don't play those games. I never played any over, but I knew what that was. But drop the handkerchief, that was common when I was a child in school. Um, one of my favorite games to play when we were growing up and would entertain my myself, my brothers, my cousins for hours was hide the key. That was so simple. You know, one person would hide, everybody would go out of the room and somebody would hide it and then come back and are you warm, are you hot, you're cold, you know, until they found it and then we'd take turns. And we usually didn't have a key, we usually had just a piece of plastic or a toy or whatever and that's what we hid. So a lot of those simple games, Sydney's right, a lot of kids wouldn't know. But I do believe there's some kids that still play them, which is, is encouraging. But uh, so many of those games were just so simple, but yet so fun. You know, today, I'm not the only one everybody kind of says about technology. It's a kind of a double-edged sword. Here I am talking to you through technology, so that's wonderful. But I think many people worry about the effect that it, that it has on children, including myself. So kind of a, it's just a different world that we're living in, I guess. But I hope you enjoyed this part of the book, and I hope you'll leave a comment and let me know what jumped out at, uh, at you, what parts you liked, what you thought about the spooky stuff, or... Um, if you still have decoration day in your area. And as always, I hope you'll drop back by next Friday so we can see what happens next with Sydney Sailor Farr.